two, one. Professor Martin Green, you are the Chief Executive of Care England. Welcome back to the Care Home Show. Thanks, Simon. Pleased to be here. It's good to, uh, good to see you again. So, uh, mo most people will, will, of course, know you and, uh, and Care England, but, um, but for anyone who isn't aware of uh, what it is you're uh, up to in the world, tell us about the purpose of Care England and uh, give us a bit of an insight around exactly what it is that the, the charity does. Well, we're a representative body for care providers and what we try and do is represent the views of care providers to critical decision makers. So that includes politicians, it might include people in places like the Department of Health and Social Care, NHS England, but also at a local level to local authorities and also to many local communities. So our role is very much about representing the sector. Beyond that, of course, we also provide a range of very good services to our members, so a lot of information services. We also respond to consultations that government put out for the care sector and there are also a range of very tangible things that our members get which hopefully will help them to save money and through saving money they can then invest in their care services. So I think we have a role which is representing the sector, we have a role which is raising the profile of the sector and we have a role of delivering some direct services and support to people who deliver care. So it's a very important job, all things being told. <laughs> so tell me, um, quite a lot's been happening since we, since we last sat down, but uh, so tell me, what's going on in your, what's been going on in your world, sorry, since we, uh, since we last spoke? Well, of course, the big thing is that since we last spoke, we have a new government with a significant majority. We have got past the hurdle of the formal Brexit from the European Union. Though, of course, what we should remember, we might have got past the formal Brexit hurdle, but there is still a lot of negotiating to do. What I've been very heartened by is the way in which the new government has really clearly shown that social care is a priority for it. And there are some significant plans that the government are developing at the moment, which are in, I think, three strategic areas. So the first thing that the Prime Minister is very focused on is what is the offer of social care to citizens? And he is a bit irritated, I think, by the constant focus on the money rather than the outcomes and the service. And I think it's good that he's focusing on that objective of what's this all about? What is our offering to citizens? I think he's also understood that there is an immediate challenge which is the funding of social care. So I look forward to some money that will be put into the system to stabilise social care. Now beyond that he has a very clear vision that he wants a long term and sustainable funding for social care and that's going to take a little bit longer and in fact in his interview in the um, recent interview with the BBC he talked about towards the end of the year and the end of the Parliament. Now I think what he means by that is that he's not ignoring the immediate problem and he has a strategy on that but for the longer term he knows it will take a little bit longer to formulate something that will go well beyond the life of his government. So on all those levels I think we're seeing some movement. Mm -hmm. How does that how does that feel from your perspective? Because obviously there's been lots of bluster about the uh, the, the social care world and not an awful lot of uh, action. What's your perspective on the um, kind of what's been said so far? And yeah, how do you feel about what's been said so far? Well, first of all, I have to put my cynicism aside because uh, there have been lots of bluster and we've had lots of governments who have been talking about this for a long time. So it's now 21 years plus since Tony Blair said he would solve it and we're five prime ministers later. But parking that issue, what I would say is I'm quite heartened by the interactions I've had with government so far because the pace of this initiative seems to be gathering quite a lot of speed and also there seems to be a longer term view of about how they want to fund and secure the future of social care. So on many levels, I'm quite heartened by the conversations thus far, but I'm not naive enough to believe that this is something that is going to be a long haul mm -hmm. and it's going to take a lot of energy and creativity to make sure that we get something that is long term. Sure. I mean, it's great to hear that you're, that you're heartened by the, by the situation. Um, I think um, it's... Uh, with all the bluster that there ha has been, to hear some type of um, uh, let's call them green shoots of positivity for the uh, for the situation sounds sounds good. Um, the the Conservative Party seem to be um, uh, they, they seem to be acting quite assertively. So obviously one would hope that uh, that, that that kind of early stage of assertiveness is carried forward and that um, some developments are, are, are made. But it, it's never going to be a straightforward process, and it's not going to be a, a well, it will be a long road to any type of. Um, 
let's call it transformation for the, no, for the sector. I agree it will be a long road, but of course the issue about a government being assertive, any government with an 80 seat majority can afford to be assertive. Mm. And also as citizens, we would expect a government that has a majority to start formulating policy and delivering it. Mm. So there is nowhere to hide. And uh, just prior to the election, of course, the Prime Minister talked a lot about political consensus. Mm -hmm. Well, I've made very clear that any government that has an 80 seat majority does not need to seek consensus. What it needs to seek is a clear vision and a delivery plan. And that's what we expect from a government with an 80 seat majority. The key word there is the delivery side of things, isn't it? It's making it, going out there and making it happen. So let's, uh, let's hope that's, uh, that, that's what is hap happening. So, um, so what would you like to see the government do? What would you like, like to see them uh, tackle uh, from, a, from a social care perspective? What are the, and what does that look like? Well, the first thing I want them to do is deal with the immediate crisis. And we have really clearly seen there is an immediate crisis. They've had all the evidence of that. They've had it from their regulator, the Care Quality Commission, who two and a half years ago talked about the sector being at a tipping point. So there is a crisis and I want them to acknowledge that. Then what I want them to do is to put in a significant amount of money that will stabilise social care. And I'm talking in terms of about four to five billion pounds. Now, this might seem an enormous amount of money, but given the amounts of money they've allocated to the health service, mm -hmm. and given the interdependency between health and social care, they will have to start putting some money in if their objectives for the NHS are going to be delivered. Mm -hmm. When they have put that money in to stabilise the system, I then think two things need to happen. First of all, they need to develop their long-term strategy, mm -hmm. and that needs to be about a dialogue with citizens and with the sector. The dialogue needs to first of all start with what is the vision for social care and then it needs to go on to how will that be delivered and what will be the outcomes for citizens and for the system and from that you'll be really clear about the amounts of money that are needed and the conversation then has to be who is paying for that, what bit is going to come from taxation, what bit is going to come from the citizen. Mm -hmm. Got you, that makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. So. Um, now we obviously live technically we live in a post brexit brexit world um can you share your view around what, what living in a post brexit world means for the for the social care sector and um uh the, the kind of impact of it if you like well, the first thing to say is we are past the point where we have formally left the EU, but we are not at the end of the negotiation phase. So we are still in some ways in a, a, a place of flux and there is a lot of uncertainty. But in the longer term, I think there will be opportunities for the care sector and it will be about, for example, issues around staffing. Rather than just having the EU to, um, uh, to attract staff from, we should be able to see a global um, development of staff from overseas. What we also need to see though is enough money in the care sector so that we can grow and develop our staff from in-country people as well. Mm -hmm. And I particularly want to see more emphasis on this in education. Uh, I was reminded yesterday actually in a meeting I was at that there are lots of people who are doing health and social care BTEC qualifications. Mm -hmm. But what we haven't done is we haven't translated that into loads of younger people going into care. Sure. So as a care sector, we need to recognise that staffing is one of our biggest issues. We need to think about how we are open to overseas recruitment, but we also have to have really clear strategies to make this an attractive place mm. for younger and indeed for older workers to work in. So a lot of work's got to be done on the quality of the work and the experience of the staff. So I think we've got a lot of challenges, but we've also got some significant opportunities. Mm -hmm. that, makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Do you think, um, what should care business owners be most cognizant of um, kind of moving forward if you like. Well, I think their biggest challenge at the moment is funding and staffing. Now, if you'd asked me about 15, 16 months ago, I would have said funding was the priority and staffing the next level priority. But I think that has now changed. And I notice there are so many care providers who have real challenges, both recruiting and retaining staff, and particularly retaining staff in specialist posts. Mm. So the challenges of getting, for example, nursing, uh, is very great. Um, also, some of the money that's gone into the NHS will make that worse because the NHS will become a more attractive place to work and that will inevitably put pressures on social care. Mm -hmm. So I think in response to that, social care providers need to start thinking about 
what they offer to staff and thinking about how they make that work high quality work and really attract people to the profession and some of that will be about flexibility some of that will be about autonomy some of that will have to be about pay and conditions mm. but I think we have to work together to get a package together we can't replicate the pay and conditions in the NHS there is not the money so what we've got to do is bring together a whole raft of things that make this a good sector to work in and actually there is a lot of evidence that it is a good sector to work in and that people get tremendous uh, outcomes from working in this sector. Mm. I think it's an interesting one isn't it because typically I think care providers generally do a, do a good job of looking after looking after their people. Um, there's probably opportunities to do to do to do better of course I mean it's not to say that, um, uh, that, that, that there aren't opportunities to be able to do better but I think the, the sector in many ways it's really quite it's really quite a humble, humble sector. They're not necessarily good at shouting about what they're what they're great at as well, which is a, it's, it's almost like a missed opportunity, isn't it? From, because from a from an, an employer brand perspective, if you if you if you like, if you've got uh, a real team um, environment, if you're great at mentoring people and looking after people and developing people and, and creating uh, a, a culture within the organisation where people they feel part of a, a something really really quite special, it's fantastic. But if if it, if the, if the people outside of the organisation, if they don't know anything about that, then how are they ever, ever going to kind of connect the dots? And there's, I can't remember the, the figures on the shortfall. Maybe you can help me help me out on that. But there's a, we need an awful lot more people operating in the sector than we do uh, as there is at the uh, at the moment, which is obviously, um, yeah, it's a big part of the battle, of course. No, and I think, you know, there's very clear evidence. Carol Jagger from the University of Newcastle said that we would need, you know, within the next 15 years, probably about 600,000 extra staff to deal with the uh, increase in demographics. Mm -hmm. But I think the point you make, Simon, is a really important one. I go around and I see so many care providers and they are doing really brilliant things and they're really connecting with their colleagues and they're developing a very, very good quality work experiences. But we don't tend to shout about it and actually that's a really good challenge for me at Care England because uh, we need our providers to talk about it but we need also representative bodies like ours to be in the vanguard of talking up this sector mm. and so we all need to be you know singing from the same hymn sheet about the good quality experience of working in good organizations and also the joy of being able to transform lives and mm. the satisfaction levels people get are absolutely phenomenal and I often think about care work is probably one of the most challenging and difficult places to work but it's also one of the most rewarding and people can really feel they're making a difference in people's lives so I think we need to shout about that more. I, I definitely agree that. It's interesting that one of the um, uh, so Neil Eastwood who I know you, you know uh, does a, a huge amount of work in, in, in the recruitment uh, side of, uh, of the social care world and I think one of the one of the stats that he uh, released on the last show that we did together, I can't remember the figure, I think it was 18, it was either 18 or 36, I'll have to go back and go and, go and, go and double check, w whatever the actual figure was. Um, so he did a, uh, he asked 300 different operators uh, to say, um, pick your, uh, your, your superhero carer and tell me what their background was, what their reason for coming into care was, and whatever the figure was, whether it was 18 or 36, it was significantly above any of the other areas, and it was ha from having had a personal experience. Yeah. So they'd already had that, um, almost like the emotional payoff of getting to look after somebody and to care for somebody and to, to improve the quality of their life, and that directed them into wanting to then doing that as a, as, as, as a profession and as a, as a career, which is, it's wonderful, but again, the, the how do we get that message out to people that that's if you've had that type of an experience, or even even, even if you haven't, that th this could be a wonderful place for you to uh, for you to work and to be able to contribute. Well, I think it's a really good point that a lot of people do come into the profession because of a personal experience. I think where we as a sector have been quite deficient is that we haven't targeted those people. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there are lots of people who had caring responsibilities and for various reasons those responsibilities have changed or, or have stopped. And they have so much experience but so much empathy and so many good values that they could bring to our profession. And what we need to do is nurture them. Um, I'm also very interested about the way in which care can be a really 
good place for people to excel, mm. often people who failed in the education system. So I had a brilliant conversation recently with somebody who told me that all throughout her life at school she had been told she wasn't good at things and suddenly she came into the care service and she was being told by her colleagues, by the people she supported, that she was actually brilliant at it. Mm. And that had given her so much satisfaction and it had transformed her life mm. in the same way she was transforming the people who she was supporting's lives. And I thought to myself what a good example that was of somebody who in a sense had been written off by the education system mm. but had such amazing skills and such brilliant values and could make a difference to our sector and those people we need to also reach out to. Mm, definitely. Oh, what a heartwarming story. It's lovely to, uh, to hear those types of things, isn't it? So it's interesting. I've got um, uh, a, a guest of mine that's coming on in the, uh, in the not too distant future. I won't, um, uh, I won't uh, disclose, uh, no, no spoiler alerts today, um, but um, uh, this particular individual is now the CEO of a, of a care group started out as a care worker so that obviously that's the um, that, that's not an easy journey but it proves that it can be done that there is career progression there obviously maybe in smaller smaller businesses then the opportunities might be might, might, might be somewhat somewhat limited but um, there are opportunities for uh, qualifications of opportunities for skills and experience whether you whether you stay in the sector or whether you don't stay in the sector being around I don't know what the average tenure is of a millennial or kind of a younger generation or even an old, older generation these days, but it, even, yeah, even some type of tenure, if, if it's the right type of person and they're kind of delivering value and kind of the right type of contribution to themselves, to their team, to the, to, to the residents or the people that they're looking after, um, it's going to make a big difference. And if the, if, if, if the facts are right that it's 600,000 people, that's no small number. No, exactly. But one of the things that's great, we are probably one of the few sectors that can offer people a job for life. Mm. Because if you look at the demographics, we are always going to need good quality care workers. What, of course, we can't do is say that it will be in the same organisation. But it, we have so many opportunities in our sector, and I don't think we also are very good at talking about the diversity of that. Mm. So we have a lot of really good care-facing roles, but we also have really great roles in things like hospitality and when I go to these amazing care homes and I go so often to brilliant care homes what's so good is to see things like the way in which the support and ancillary staff are really connected to what the service is about and I went into a, a really um, lovely party recently and what was great there were the ancillary staff the cleaning staff the administrative staff and they're all there celebrating somebody's 100th birthday and really enjoying that and recognizing as well that cleaners and hospitality staff are so important to the quality of life of the person who is in that care setting. Mm. And those people are really unsung heroes along with our fantastic care staff. Now, in all those areas, there is real opportunity for career progression. So we need to get those messages out to, to, to more and more people. Mm, definitely. Had um, uh, Avnish Goyal on uh, on recently, and we were we were talking about a, a story that we both like. Um, that I'm sure you will have heard of, but I'll, I'll reshare it anyway because it's a good one. But uh, I think it was um, uh, JF Kennedy was going around um, uh, one of the, uh, the NASA space stations, um, and uh, he was kind of asking people what they were what they were doing, and. The, the janitor responded. We said, um, we're, "We're putting a man on the man on the moon." The the whole um, the mentality of the team is: we've all got our own individual contributions, and we're all we're all we're all making sure that 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 that, that happens. And I think it's such a it's so pertinent to the to the sector because you could be in a janitorial role or a uh, some type of cler clerical or administration role or somebody in the kitchens or whatever it might whatever it might be, you're still making people's lives better. It's still yeah. such a valuable contribution. No, exactly, and, and that notion of teamwork, and, and Avnish is really good at doing that at Hallmark. You know, I've been to sessions where Hallmark staff have been together and there's a real feeling of a team that supports each other as well as supporting the people that, that are in their services. And that really helps to give a better quality to the work. It makes people feel part of something. And as you feel part of something, inevitably your well-being increases. And if you have a good experience as a worker, you're going to transfer that good experience to the people you support. And you will never get good services from people who are being treated badly. And I think we all as, as, as employers should remind ourselves of that. Mm, definitely. I, me and my team spend a lot of time on um, helping care businesses with company culture and there's 
the, the simplistic way to kind of uh, to describe the return on investment is if you create the, the right culture where everyone's got buy-in uh, and the team are acting more purposely, they, they're, they're going to experience greater well-being. And why would you want to leave if you're part of this fantastic group of people that's doing such important work? Um, obviously, with recruitment and retention being such a big challenge, your the cost uh, and the time, of course, as well, uh, is going to be um, that should come down. I know um, Angela Boxall, uh, the COO of Majestic Air, was saying quite recently in a workshop that we did that um, uh, they, they've spent a huge amount of time working on their on their culture. I think their the cost of recruitment and retention for them is. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, I think it's less than half the half the national average, which a, a business that size, is, it's a lot of money that can then be reinvested into the business. Of course, you look after people better. Um, sorry, the, 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 the team form feel more fulfilled in what they're doing. They're always going to end up looking after the residents better because they're a more cohesive team. It's a more con consistent team. And the two offshoots from that is you're likely to get far greater CQC reports because people are getting looked after better and then your reputation in the community that you serve uh, gets better as well so opportunities to increase occupancy um, and all of that type of stuff there's it's a it kind of touches upon er everything and it's it, it's um, it makes sense it just makes sense across all, all planes so no, well it does and of course what it is is a real reflection of the values of social care mm. and the values of social care that we direct to the people we support are also the values that we should be absolutely ingrained in the way we support our colleagues and um, you know that example from Majestic Care is a really good example because the amounts of money that you have to spend when there is a lot of staff turnover can then be reinvested in the delivery of a quality offering to both the residents, their families and also the staff and so there are so many wins. I also uh, want to say that we should think about getting more flexible in how we offer work. Mm. So increasingly I think there are people who make a great contribution, they might be for example early retired people or whatever who might not want to work full time but might have a contribution to make and I think we could start seeing uh, particularly with the advent of technology which helped with rotaring etc we could see much more flexibility around how we offer work the benefit of that as well is then you create your own bank of staff that can fill at mm. times when there is a challenge somebody being ill or whatever so that again will reduce the amount of dependency on agency mm. and that will have an, a, a really positive impact on the business which then can reinvest its money in the quality of the care definitely definitely we um uh we took a slight tangent to go and talk kind of people type stuff we were kind of in the in the thick of a conversation around the uh, the brexit side of things so i'm gonna i'm gonna come back in on that for uh, for a second but um i'm i'm an eternal optimist so i'm always looking to try and uh find the find the good in things and you kind of touched upon it a little bit but I'd like to hear your opinion on um, so in the kind of post Brexit world, if you uh, if you will, what are the opportunities? Where can we see the good in the uh, the situation? Because I know a lot of people are fearful and uh, frustrated and kind of a mixture of all sorts of different things. But where um, there's always opportunities with uh, with these types of things. So yeah, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, I think there are opportunities, and I think it's like everything. Whatever the world throws at you, the challenge is how you find your way through it and round it, and how you get the best out of it rather than the worst out of it. There are certainly some uh, challenges, but there are also some opportunities. So, for example, you know, if on overseas recruitment, we'll be able to think, well, we can now have the world as a potential place for us to get good people to help and support our services. There may also be some opportunities when we have new trade deals with people to reduce commodity prices. Mm. Um, so I think there will inevitably be some challenges, but there will be opportunities. But I go back to the point that life throws many challenges at you, and that the people who succeed are the ones who don't see it as the reason to stop, but they see it as the reason to be creative, innovative, and find their way through to the other side, which will then be very advantageous to them. Mm. It's all about taking ownership for, for situations Absolutely. and things and having that long-term view and thinking to yourself, okay, how do we make this? How do we make this work? And how do we make it work in our, in, in our favour as well for the, for the betterment of the sector? So um, I guess the how Brexit unfolds over the next uh, kind of coming years and things will um, uh, 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 impact this on, on, on some level. But tell me about your, your kind of vision for the, for the future of care. When you, when you sit and contemplate the, the sector in the future, what do you see? 
Well, I think we're going to have to have a very much more flexible approach to care and I'd like to see care providers developing their model so that they're offering a range of things to local communities that might be lower level preventative services. Now the beauty for that is that that will help people to engage with the care provider. It will provide the care provider with a stream of people who might use their services further down the line. It will also diversify the funding base so there'll be other opportunities to get income for your services for from these other um, uh, services that you might develop at the side of care. Mm. Uh, so I think it's going to be a, a landscape that's evolving. Now many care providers are already doing these things um, and I think we should acknowledge that and applaud them for it. But I think in the future what I want to see is this become the norm rather than the exception. Mm. And so of course it will also be very based on where your services are. So having an eye to what's going on in your locality and thinking about how you can deliver services that support people. I think the other thing that the care sector needs to do is be mindful of how much money has gone into the NHS and what we have to do is develop services whereby we might be able to draw down some of that money which will help the sustainability of our businesses. That makes a lot of sense. Do you think, um, well, what, what needs to change from a policy perspective and then from kind of an operational perspective to make your vision of care uh, a, a reality, do you think? Well, I think we don't need necessarily more policy. What we need is culture change, and some of that culture change, I'm afraid, has to come from the NHS. Mm -hmm. The NHS is an incredibly large bureaucracy, and it has become very focused on the bureaucracy, not the outcomes. And people need to remember that the NHS is a mechanism to deliver things for citizens. It is not an end in itself. And I want it to move away from this focus on process and organisations, and I want to remind it itself that it's about people and outcomes and we are all in the space where if we can deliver the outcomes for our citizens we should be given an opportunity to do so. Now of course people will then jump up and down and say oh, he's talking about privatising the NHS. My view on that is I'm talking about getting better outcomes for citizens mm. and I would also remind people that the NHS in large part is already privatised because it is full of GPs who are private contractors on contract to the NHS just as social care providers are. So there is no reason why the NHS should not adopt the same policy mm. with the social care sector as they adopt with GPs. Yeah, definitely. Do you, um from a from a from a cultural perspective, um, uh, how how far away are we from them, the the the, the health service kind of having that type of uh, let's say paradigm shift? We're a million miles from it, and it was a good example this morning. I went into a meeting in the Department of Health to talk about an initiative that was going to transform health for people in care homes. The first thing I was told was we are an organisation that's going through a reorganisation. So I told them so is Apple but my telephone still works. <laughs> so there is an issue about how they keep the show on the road at a point when they're reorganising. Now interestingly if you're a social care provider and you're going through a reorganisation the regulator doesn't give you any time to say let us breathe they say you are here to deliver quality and your reorganisation is something that you have to deal with but it mustn't impact on the end user. Mm. Well the same thing needs to be told to the NHS. The other challenge is that the NHS does not seem to be very good at creating some clear measures, some milestones and also some policies on how to deal with people who don't deliver what they've asked them to deliver. Mm. So this morning I was, I was asking questions about what were the targets, what were the measures, what were the time frames, what were the budgets mm -hmm. and none of those questions were answered. Now if you're trying to do something that's paradigm shifting I would suggest that you have to get all those ducks in a line so you have to get your vision, you have to get your objectives, you have to get your measures, you have to get your budgets and you have to get your time frames clear mm. and then you will see where you are on the, the line of progress and unfortunately this is not the way the NHS has worked in the past but if it's going to be fit for purpose in the 21st century deliver outcomes to citizens and incidentally citizens don't sit in a silo, they work with the NHS, they work with social care providers, they do things like go to their supermarkets and their banks and what we need to understand is that all the bits of the system need to work together and focus on the outcomes to the citizens. Mm, very much so, very much so. 
Um, from your perspective and kind of from your network of, uh, of care business operators, um, you touched upon models of care. I guess the, um, that, that's something that care business owners can uh, kind of take ownership for, for themselves. Um, what are you seeing work? Uh, where are you, uh, where, what do you see that's um, kind of inspiring you and giving you kind of hope for new care models for the future? Well, I'm certainly seeing real improvements in quality. As I'm going around, I'm seeing care services that understand that their role is about giving people a life, not a service. Mm. And I go into care homes where I talk to residents and I see that for myself. So a good example of this was I was talking to a resident recently who had lived in her own home for the last 11 years, her partner had died, she'd had a stroke, and she was living a very, very closed life, never going out, having some support from the local authority, but it was very minimal. And I talked to her about the transition into a care home. And she was great because she said to me, well, I thought it was the end of my life. And she said, I've now been here 14 weeks and I realize it's the beginning of a new chapter. So she said to me, I did something that I haven't done for 14 years. I went out and bought new clothes. She said, when I arrived here, I realized how shabby I'd become. I realized that the people in this care home were really great in terms of looking to their appearance. So she said, when I said this to the care worker, the care worker said, well, let's go out and buy some new clothes. So this was something that had changed her life because what it had done, it had reinforced her identity mm -hmm. and enabled her to feel proud of who she was, which had not been delivered when she was in a community setting. Mm. So I see lots of examples of that. Now on a bigger level, what I'm also seeing is care homes that are understanding that there are a multiplicity of needs out there in the community and they're supporting them. So care homes, for example, that are providing really good quality care to their residents, but they're also centres of local communities. Mm. So people who might be living with a relative who's, who's living with dementia are coming into the care home to get respite care, to get advice, to get support. Care homes are providing that, they're charging that quite usefully, so it's another stream of income, but the impact it's having on the people living in those communities is enormous. So I was, I was talking to a, a woman whose husband was living with quite advanced dementia, and she was having problems because he had very nocturnal patterns. Mm. She'd agreed with the care home that for two nights he would go into the care home. And she said to me, what was great was the care home also said to her, if you have a crisis, ring us. And she said to me, I've never actually had to do it, but the knowledge that I can gives me so much comfort and peace of mind. Mm. Now that is such a small thing, but it's made such a big difference. And so care homes have the real opportunities to be the centers of the management of long-term conditions in local communities. And when I was talking to that lady, I know that when her husband is in need of full-time, long-term care, she will want him to go to that care service because it knows her husband and because she trusts it and has built up a relationship with it and the staff. Mm -hmm. So these are the sorts of initiatives that we need to think about in the care sector to broaden what we do and to make our services more available to the community. That has benefits to the community, but it also has benefits to us as sustainable organisations. Definitely. I, I spend my life speaking to care home operators and business leaders and um, uh, 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 a lot of time in home speaking to well, everyone in the, everyone from kind of um, uh, throughout the throughout the sector, if you will, and uh, plenty of residents too. I hasten to uh, hasten to add. And I think the um, I think the, what you're saying is absolutely correct. I think the the homes that the homes that are to the extent that the home is embedded in the in the local community uh, and they're engaging with the local community, there's this is somewhat anecdotal from kind of what I've seen, but the ones that are the most embedded in the local community are the ones that are the thriving um, hub within the community are the most successful. Absolutely. And, it, and it's because they're, they're taking a whole community approach, they're getting people in from the community that might not have might not have had any um, reason to engage with a with a care home, but it's it's um, I guess in a kind of business term you kind of call it brand building and reputation and all of those things. But if you're touching people and you're making people's lives better that aren't anything to do with um, necessarily the people that you're looking um, that you're looking after that live in your live in your care home at the time, um, that can only be a only be a good thing. The perception of care is obviously um, I, th I think it's improving over over time. I'd like to think that. Um, uh, that the narrative is kind of going in the in the right direction, but largely, I think a lot of people see a, a care home as being a kind of dreadful place where 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 um, 
you buy into the kind of the uh, media narrative, some certain media narratives, um, it, that's your way to overcome that and to, be, to, to, to assertively do that in a way which, again, it benefits everyone in, in, involved. To your point, it's, it, it, it works from a, from, a, from a business, from a commercial perspective as well, um, but you're just doing a better job of looking after people and getting involved in a community, which is important to humans, generally. No, well, exactly, and I mean, that was one of the reasons why Care England, with, with uh, others like NAPA and uh, NCF, decided to develop the Care Home Open Day because we knew that there were lots of communities where if the care home opened themselves to the community there'd be huge benefits mm. to the residents and also to the local community and you know I've seen some great examples of, of the ways in which that's done and not in a forced way so another good example from Hallmark actually was they have a fantastic care home in Wimbledon mm. and it has an art gallery where residents have done art and this is displayed in in the in in the service mm -hmm. and people from outside come to see the art now that makes it something that people want to do it also provides real opportunities for local people to meet people in the care home friendships mm -hmm. develop and so these are small things on some level but they're absolutely paradigm shifting in terms of getting the public to understand what goes on in a care home mm -hmm. and also to make the fear of care homes um, sort of ebb away because people see the reality of care homes rather than just what they think rather than what actually is happening and of course we as a sector have been on a journey and if you look at care homes 30 40 years ago well we wouldn't want to be in them mm. look at care homes now and it's a completely transformed experience mm. Mm, definitely. Coming back to um, uh, the, the, the recruitment uh, recruitment challenges specifically as, uh, as well um, your brand, your employer brand, how people talk about you, your, your reputation, all of those types of uh, types of things. If people know that you've got a wonderful home where great things great things happen and there's a positive energy and things like that, that's only going to serve um, uh, the, the recruitment challenges in a in, in a positive positive way as well because people are saying good good things about uh, about your home and about what goes on go, goes on inside it as well. So yeah, very much so. I know that um, uh, your your big on technology and big on innovation for uh, the, the, the future of the sector. Um, what, what do you see as, from, from a care business owner's perspective, um, where do, um, what do they need to be thinking about relevant to, 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 to innovation or where are the opportunities, do you think? Well, I think we've got to embrace technology, not least of which because there are going to be so many people who need care and support. But what I would say is the first technologies we should be developing are the ones that improve the quality of life for the person who uses the service. All too often, technology has been used to police the workforce. And I think, you know, domiciliary care services where the local authority has said, we must have a system that tells me whether this care worker went in at nine o'clock or one minute past nine completely forgetting that the purpose of that visit was to ensure that that person had a better experience who was, who was using the service. Mm. So what I want us to do is first of all to develop technologies that help people live well. Now again I've seen some great examples of this, quite low level, not really expensive but transformational in terms of the resident experience. So uh, again I was I've keep um, mentioning the Hallmark um, uh, example, but I was at the opening of their new home last week and I saw examples of how people will get out of bed and the light will come on, so that gives them the access to the bathroom. Now these are incredibly useful but technologically based systems that are not hugely expensive and particularly mm. when you put them in at the point of, of, of building the care home. So I think we've got to look at technology in that way. There's also a piece whereby we can improve integration. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, things like Fitbits that transfer data about the person's health to health professionals so that when you see changes, people can put in proactive support at a very early stage. Now a good example of this, I was in a care home in Lincolnshire where they had Fitbits. There was a man who had advanced dementia. He had very, very agitated patterns and he suffered tremendously from urinary tract infections. Now this had resulted in eight hospital visits in the space of 11 months. 
When he had his Fitbit, they noticed that slight increases in temperature were the prelude to a UTI. So they put him proactive medicine and that person never went to hospital again and was able to live well in his care setting and actually die in his care setting. Now that is a simple piece of technology, but the, the impact on the user was enormous. Mm. But also there was an impact on the system. You know, endless uh, A&E visits are really bad for the person. They're really bad for the system. Mm. This was simple technology that stopped all that. So there's a lot of technology that we use. Also things like how to transfer information, getting social care onto NHS mail, which is something we're very uh, interested in doing, helps to transfer information. The more we transfer information, the more we can deliver more appropriate care for the individual. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of this stuff, it's, it, it, it exists. These are, th these are things that are relatively, uh, relatively sim simple in the, in the grand scheme of things. But to your point, make a massive, massive impact. I mean, you think about the, 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 uh, the, the lights um, for, to help make sure that people uh, can get to the bathroom. Okay, that's, I mean, that technology's been around for, for, for years and years and years. The, the application is comparatively, comparatively new. Um, but whatever the stats are, I'm sure they're significant, but helping make sure that people don't trip and fall. Yeah. It's obviously the, the, the negative, de the detriment of that is obviously significant. So again, just a, a simple, um, a simple innovation making such a such a big difference so well, one of the other things I want to do and why we're developing the tech bricks is to get care providers in a room with technology people. Mm. Because one of the things that I often hear from care providers is they say to me, but the system doesn't quite do what I want it to. Well, if you can get in a room with a techie and you tell a techie what you want to achieve, you know, 99% of the time they will come up with a solution. And so I think <laughs> one of our, our roles at Care England is to get the sector and technology providers together so that whenever we see a challenge, we can say, how do we get some technological piece of equipment or service that will help us to support that person in a more effective way and also help us to do that more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of these um, new technologies like pressure pads and lights and stopping falls, etc. They also have the added benefit of not disturbing people in the night. You know, there was that old uh, adage where you used to have to go around every hour to make sure people were okay. Mm. Well, would you want your bedroom door opened every hour? Well, I certainly wouldn't want Definitely mine. <laughs> so these technologies will really help to improve efficiency, but also improve the experience of the person in the service as well. Mm. I think that's a really, really good point as well. I mean, think about, uh, sleep is almost like the elixir of life. If you're being interrupted, um, it, I mean, even if you don't wake up every time, but if you're woken up twice in the in the night, what's the likelihood that your quality of sleep is going to go down quite dramatically? Significant. We all know that we're not on our not on our A game when we haven't had a, had a good night's sleep, and if that's happening consistently, then that's going to build up over time. And um, yeah, uh, the 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 best case scenario is that you're going to be a bit grumpy. The worst case scenario is that you're not going to be. Um, uh, not going to be uh, maybe as cognizant as you might be otherwise and again it may lead to a, uh, an accident occurring which if you can avoid that of course it makes for a, 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 a tremendous a tremendous different difference on the on the individual of course. No, no, of course and of course some of this also very low level technology can do things like test people's quality of sleep mm. now that's something which if you do that in a care home setting you might then be able to adjust things like meal times or how you have that downtime before you go to bed to enable people to have better sleep mm -hmm. so sometimes if we know what the challenge is we can find a solution to it and technology is going to help us to identify some of the issues and then we as care providers are very good at then saying well there are things we're going to try to make this better for the resident mm, definitely definitely as a sector I don't think that we've been uh, the, the quickest off the mark let's say from a from a technological technological perspective if you will what what concerns do you have around technological adoption well, I think the problem is as well that we haven't been encouraged to do it. So, for example, when they wanted technology in the NHS, they put bucket loads of money into the NHS to facilitate it. I think also people need to understand that technology has now got to a stage where it's much more user friendly. Mm. So when the things like the mobile phone first came out, sometimes they weren't very user friendly and I found that I struggled. Now when my iPhone, I voice type absolutely everything 
everything. I give voice commands. And so the technology itself has become easier to use. But I don't think we've got that message out very effectively. Mm. And I think we need to get the message out that technology can make a difference. It can produce better outcomes. It can produce better efficiencies. And also, we want it to be easy to use. Nobody is going to use something that's difficult and complicated. So that's a challenge to the technology sector, mm. that when you come up with a solution, don't make it so that you have to be Einstein to use it. Make it so that people like me can use it and colleagues in care services can use it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You might have touched upon this already, but what, what technology, technology for the sector are you most excited about? Well, I'm excited about some of the stuff that will give us, for example, good audit trails about how people have been supported. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm excited about things that improve the quality of life for residents, but I'm also excited about things that prove that we have delivered our outcomes prove that we have an audit trail for doing it but also I'm very excited by how we can use data as part of our planning and development process. Now increasingly because of technology we're becoming a much more data rich sector mm. but our next challenge is how do we use that data, how do we interpret it and how do we make it have an impact on the quality, the outcomes and the efficiency of our services. So those areas <coughs> really excite me. Mm. Because you've got um, initiatives <coughs> within Care England focused on te digital technologies. It, yeah. Daniel Casson yeah, um, is working on that uh, side of things, and then you've got uh, things like the uh, the Care Innovation Hub as uh, as well, um, who are are looking at I guess kind of the more embryonic end of the uh, end of the spectrum. But um, yeah, I think the, the more people that are focusing on this, the the, the better. And from an adoption perspective, hopefully more conversations will mean higher adoption, uh, people kind of getting their head round it as such and thinking actually you know what this is going to make this, this is going to make a real big difference so it has to be on the on the agenda as, uh, as such so um, I've got one last uh, last question just to, before we wrap things up so if you had one piece of advice for care, uh, care leaders uh, today what would that one piece of advice be? Focus on your vision for your service and focus on your vision for the sector because when you're clear about your vision it is much easier to deliver it and so often I think what happens is we get very blurred about what we're trying to achieve so be really clear about your objectives and your vision and then think about how you operationalize that. I think that's a cracking piece of advice. Martin Green, it's been a pleasure having you on the show again. Thanks, Thank Simon. you so much. Thank you.